Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. And also by the generous support of listeners like you, who choose to support us at Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Patreon.com slash trifles. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, Boscombe Valley was mysterious, Shoscombe Place was old, and the lodge was hysterical, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Was Holmes more of a tea drinker or a coffee fancier? And what are all of the alcoholic drinks mentioned in the stories? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people have done for Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 340, Dining with Sherlock Holmes. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the podcast where we look into the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, it's always a pleasure to dine with you. Oh, it's always a pleasure to dine with you, and I'm hoping you're going to pick up the check. <laughs> it's always a gamble. You never know in these, uh, in these scenarios. But, um, yeah, you know, one of the great things about being a fan of Sherlock Holmes is exchanging views with each other. It's what we do here every week on this show. And a lot of times in Sherlockian societies, the gatherings are largely around food. And uh, sitting across the table, whether we're debating with people, just getting to know them as individuals, um, or listening to a learned lecture after we all eat and, and uh, drink together. Uh, it's a wonderful experience that food uh, allows us to, to have with respect to our unique interest here. Yeah, absolutely. And occasionally, the food is less than remarkable, but the conversation <laughs> the conversation and the friendship is always remarkable. It sure is. Well, uh, we are going to be discussing some particular uh, recipes today. This is um, a little bit off canon, but it's inspired by the canon, so I figure we are still in fair territory. Um but it is inspired by the book Dining with Sherlock Holmes, a Baker Street cookbook by Julia Carlson Rosenblatt and Frederick Fritz Sonnenschmidt. Uh, we will get to some of the specifics here in just a moment. And if you'd like the show notes for this episode, they're available at ihose.co slash trifles340. That'll take you directly to the Sherlock Holmes podcast.com website. You can poke around there. You can find a link to the book as well as other things of interest. And I think, if I am not mistaken, we will have a playlist there because we have done um, a number of other episodes about food. We've talked about Simpsons, uh, the supper that was put out at uh, A Noble Bachelor, talked about Sherlock Holmes' dining habits, talked about British food. Uh, vegetarians or vegetarian restaurants, buffets, breakfast at Baker Street, eggs, and most recently, the dairy industry. So dining with Sherlock Holmes should be a nice addition to that playlist. Simply yes. uh, check it out by going to ihose.co slash trifles340. Well, we are going to do a little... Uh, something a little different in this episode. I thought it might be interesting if we, first of all, crack the cover on Dining with Sherlock Holmes and then use it as an opportunity to talk about three recipes from uh, the book here. You have three, I have three, and uh, we can explore these together. 
Does that sound like a plan? Sounds perfect. Perfect. Oh, all right. Well, the book itself, it's a fascinating book. It was uh, put together um, by Julia Carlson Rosenblatt and Fritz Sonnenschmidt. Julia, Julia joined us on the I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere podcast. I think she was with us on episode 103, if I'm not mistaken. Al and Julie Rosenblatt uh, joined us both. They founded a series of dinners at the Culinary Institute of America, which is which is a, um, a, 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 a an august and respected institution where many master chefs train, located in upstate New York, not too far from the Rosenblatt's house. And during the course of these uh, course of these dinners, uh, Julie and Fritz Sonnenschmidt who was a master chef there, um, developed some wonderful recipes. And over the course of their collaboration, they realized, you know, there is a book that could be had out of this. And we talk a little bit with Julie about that in episode 103. We'll have a link to that in the show notes so you can really check that out in depth. But there's a wonderful uh, excerpt in the introduction um, of, well, not the introduction, the first chapter of Dining with Sherlock Holmes. She says, We've chosen to write about a Sherlock Holmes and a Dr. Watson who are more than mere creations of fiction. We can visualize Holmes in his various poses, a tireless sleuth, hot upon a scent, a Baker Street companion dazzling Watson with his mind reading, or even today, a retired centenarian quietly keeping bees upon the South Downs of Sussex. The late Vincent Starrett, a beloved Sherlockian author, has expressed the feeling and the certainty with these words, they still live for all that love them well, in a romantic chamber of the heart, in a nostalgic country of the mind, where it is always 1895. And that's, I, I think that romanticizing of Sherlock Holmes allows us to connect him with recipes that weren't necessarily mentioned in the canon itself. And I think that's where Julie and Fritz do a really wonderful job of putting this book together, of coming up with um, appetizing, authentic cuisine that in some way can be connected to the canon while it is not necessarily mentioned in the canon. Yes, I very much agree. And it, it's indicative of the interest that brings so many of us together to talk about the world of Sherlock Holmes. You have an interest in that nostalgic corner of the mind, as you say, Vincent Starrett observed, where it's always 1895, but it's the golden age, the end of the 19th century, and you wonder what life was like. What did it sound like when you walked on the streets? What did it feel like to be in a handsome cab? What was it like in Baker Street? And you see how that manifests itself with people who devote so much time and energy to recreating the sitting room, to even accompanying it, as Denny Dobry has, with recordings of what the street sounds would be like. And that was such a great element of the Granada series. Well, here are Fritz and Julie going back in time and pulling together an invaluable collection of authentic Victorian cuisine for all of the meals of the day. And those dinners that they had over the years recreated so many of these dishes and gave you an opportunity to, for an evening to imagine what it was like to be at Simpsons in the Strand, to be at a great one of the great restaurants in London, and um, to be sampling that authentic cuisine, and therefore in deepening your participation in the world of Holmes and Watson. Yeah, and and I think um, in in the spirit of that, these recipes that we've uh, selected, they each kind of put us in a particular setting. And um, I'd like you to lead us off, Bert, with your first recipe selection. Kind of tell us where it comes from. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a fine start to the day. So uh, we, we will begin there. 
it's as you pointed out earlier, one of the many interesting and great things about dining with Sherlock Holmes is the way it's been organized and connected to elements of the cases of Sherlock Holmes to the life of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And here we have breakfast to celebrate the recovery of a lost document. Hmm. Sherlock Holmes had said of Mrs. Hudson, of course, her cuisine is a little limited, but she has as good an idea of breakfast as a Scotch woman. And, you know, many people have taken that to be a comment on shortcomings but no, no, that's, I, that's, I think that's just Holmes being, being um, whimsical. And so we have breakfast at the conclusion of the Naval Treaty, where Mrs. Hudson showed herself more than capable of producing a very hearty morning repast, curried chicken with ham and eggs, and everybody was hungry except poor old Percy Phelps, who was about to get his appetite back. But um, anyway, and the, let's just say the, uh, the the cookbook here does not have a recipe for the document for the treaty itself. <laughs> First, boil a parchment. <laughs> mm. No, but a menu is suggested, and one of the lovely things on the menu here is what we would think of as eggs Benedict, but which in this recipe appears as ham and eggs with uh, a half a cup of hollandaise sauce. So it's two English muffins cut in half and toasted. Now here they say slices of canned ham. Oh, canned ham. No, no. We can probably do better than that. Some mm. asparagus tips, if possible, white. Four teaspoons of finely grated cheddar cheese and a half cup of hollandaise. And um, we are given a recipe that follows for making hollandaise sauce, which is a lot of fun. But I will f I'll frequently uh, have order Eggs Benedict when I'm out. And, you know, if you were in a real restaurant where everything really is made from, from uh, scratch as opposed to previously prepared jarred hollandaise sauce, it really is, a, um, you know, a lovely dish. It really is. It, it, it's um, it, it's not it's not an everyday dish. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> but it is it is a lovely treat, and there are variations on eggs Benedict as well, uh, where one could use uh, salmon in place of ham, for example. Uh, I think the addition of asparagus on the top is a, a lovely uh, springtime tradition. Uh, it really adds a bit of flavor as well. So uh, we can imagine Sherlock Holmes, again, not enjoying this every day, but particularly as a celebratory feast with uh, the recovery of the lost document. Mm. Well, uh, let's move from uh, breakfast to um, uh, something uh, on the road. You know, Holmes was frequently on the go, and... Um, and as uh, Julie and Fritz write, uh, Holmes usually reserved mealtime as a period of relaxation. If he was in the middle of a case, he suspended all discussion of it until after the last course had been enjoyed. Occasionally, however, he departed from custom and took a sandwich as he worked on a problem. Uh, Holmes prepared his own sandwich, and it must have been simplicity itself. And uh, this was the... Adventure of the Barrel Coronet, where uh, Watson observes he sli he cut a slice of beef from the joint on the sideboard, sandwiched it between two rounds of bread, and thrusting this rude meal into his pocket, he started off upon an expedition. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a simple roast beef sandwich, and I think this is one of the great joys of life, is some of these wonderful uh, kind of soul-quenching uh, simple meals, uh, simple sandwiches that are just so enjoyable. In this case, the irregular sandwich consists of a piece of beef sirloin, uh, some coarse salt, crushed black peppercorns, uh, some thyme, allspice, a clove of garlic crushed, uh, a little bit of bay leaf. And you, you mix the seasonings together, rub them on the beef, let it cure for 24 hours, roast the meat in an oven, uh, and then uh, take it out when it is uh, well to your done to your liking, but typically uh, medium rare is preferred, and uh, it may be served hot or cold, uh, and and uh, served on a uh, between a couple of slices of fresh baked white bread, 
Uh, you can even add a little bit of a horseradish or horseradish cream uh, to it for the seasoning of your choice. Just a lovely mm. mouth-watering sandwich. Mm. Mm. That's a great selection. And the next one that I selected is also something small and handheld. And it is in Dining with Sherlock Holmes under the heading of the Cornish Horror. Uh-oh. <laughs> Why not tell them of the Cornish horror, the strangest case I have handled? Well, uh, while Holmes was in Cornwall, he no doubt partook of the local specialty, the Cornish pasty, finding it particularly fitting for sustenance during his long walks and solitary meditations on the moor. And Fritz and Julie have, uh, you know, a really nice recipe for a Cornish pasty here, including the, the uh, pastry, obviously, as well as the filling. Now, here we have an authentic pasty pastry recipe, which is basically two cups of flour and three ounces of lard, um, you know, which is seldom um, as pop used as frequently today in pastries as it has been in the past in various crusts or shortening. A um, pinch of salt and a bit of water, a third to a half a cup of water, and that will get you your pastry. But the filling recipe they have is quite nice. It's a quarter pound of beef or chicken liver, half a pound of ground beef, two potatoes, and then we've got onion, carrot, celery, turnip, and a beaten egg. And I actually had a time when I did make some of the dishes in this book years ago, and I have a memory of making a Cornish pasty following this recipe. And it really was, uh, really came out quite well. Mm. And, and that's a, just a lovely uh, item to enjoy, whether you're on the go or seated at home. Uh, it's just, a, it's, it's comfort food. It really is. Yeah, it is. But it's one of these things too, you know, that really requires technique and practice. And so if you, you know, rolling it out and shaping it and preparing the filling and getting everything just right tends to be a real learning experience, as all these things are the first time you do them. You know, there was a, there was the, of course, the well-known book uh, from um, Julie to Julia, you know, where that uh, someone recreated all of the recipes in Julia Child's first French chef cookbook during the course yes. of the year, I think. It would be interesting if somebody had a similar challenge with dining with Sherlock Holmes and recreated all of the recipes, you know, beginning on page one and going all the way to the end. That would make uh, quite an experience over a year. Well, maybe after we complete the Trifles series, we can start a YouTube channel, Bert, and, <laughs> and you and I can do that. <laughs> Oh, we need to partner with Melissa Clark, you know, or somebody. Uh, <laughs> somebody. Somebody who knows her way around the kitchen, yeah. his way around the kitchen. Well, right now, let's uh, partner with our sponsor, and we'll be back with the last three episodes, right after, or the last three recipes, I should say, right after this quick word. The Baker Street Journal has undergone minor changes from time to time, but the good news is it still looks and feels the same as it has over the last decade, even though it has a new editor. Dan Andriaco brings the sensibilities of a journalist, editor, and lifelong Sherlockian to the BSJ as he takes over for Steve Rothman, who spent 23 years in the editor's seat. In his outgoing editorial, Steve reminds us about the attraction and staying power of the Baker Street Journal. When I started reading submissions for the journal in the autumn of 1999, I was impressed by their quantity and quality. 23 years on, that judgment hasn't changed. I am regularly amazed by journals writers' ingenuity. They are curious, imaginative, and widely read. And he's absolutely right. Get yourself on a list of subscribers so you too can be impressed with what Baker Street Journal writers have to say on a quarterly basis. Simply go to BakerStreetIrregulars.com and sign up today. We 
are back and we are dining with Sherlock Holmes. Uh, let's move on to dinner at this point. I, I have to say this is the single most cooked recipe in my household from this cookbook. And it all goes back to an experience I had uh, at a Sherlock Holmes uh, society meeting. It was at the Men on the Tour. And it was the last meal I remember having um, in the Great Hall at Gillette Castle when the men on the tour used to be able to meet there. And mm. it was a catered affair. And, and rather than uh, individual dishes here, it was served buffet style. So there was a variation here, which I'll describe. But the recipe in question is chicken breasts Murillo or Murillo. Um, and, and Julie and Fritz have to say, in the world of cuisine, a gourmet dish was once created to honor the Spanish painter Bartolome Esteban Murillo, who lived from 1617 to 1682. The name Murillo has Holmesian connotations as well, for it was Don Juan Murillo, the uh, Tiger of San Pedro, whose villainy was uh, marked in the adventure of Wisteria Lodge. Um, and the recipe itself is very straightforward. Four boneless chicken breasts, salt, pepper, butter, uh, mushroom caps, shallots, white wine, double cream, and fine noodles. Uh, and it's very simple. You just cut the chicken breast into four pieces, season it with the salt and pepper, brown them on both sides in the hot butter, then add the mushrooms, cook them with the chicken uh, in the oven at about 350. And uh, uh, separately, you fry the shallots lightly in uh, some butter, add some white wine, boil it down to half the volume, add the cream, and uh, cook until the sauce is creamy. And then you pour that over the chicken and you serve it with the buttered noodles. Um, and it's just a delightful dish. Um, and the, the way I experienced it at the Men on the Tour as a, uh, as a buffet thing is it, it was uh, the chicken uh, cut into about one-inch cubes mixed in with the noodles and the sauce. And it was just... Well, it was enough to make me want to seek this book out and cook this at home. <laughs> well, that's a great thing, you know, and it is like, unlike other recipes in this particular book, it's one that's really in the reach of a 2023 home, uh, you know, a contemporary home cook. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, I have not really found a... I mean, there are things here. I have not found something that I have really made um, for as a, as a dinner dish. But there is one that's, you know, that's reasonably close. And there's a recipe here for chicken pie the English way. And uh, we do occasionally make chicken pot pies. And the recipe that, that they have here in the book is, um, you know, reasonably close to the, um, the recipe that we happen to, my wife and I happen to follow for chicken pot pie, which includes, you know, obviously all of the fillings, onion, celery, carrots, flour, chicken stock you need, and uh, a little bit of a homemade crust. And it's not all that complex, but the nice thing about the recipe that they have here is, um, you know, that it's, it's um, you know, really very direct and very simple and very hard to, <laughs> something important to me, very hard to screw up. <laughs> yeah, well, that, again, that's uh, another just wonderful comfort food. I think many of these kind of reflect on that, uh, that ability to just sit down and enjoy um, you know, it's not necessarily fancy, uh, but it is a treat for the senses. Mm. Um, and I thought I would wrap up the, uh, the meal here, as it were, the multi-course meal here with a dessert. Oh, as yeah, we, me, we've, me we've, too, I have one. We've talked a lot about, um, you know, the main courses, the sandwiches, the, the hearty pies and pastries and whatnot, but... Um, here, here we do get a little fancier, and I'm okay with that as far as dessert is concerned. And that is where Peaches Cartwright 
enters <laughs> the scene. You remember Peaches Cartwright, Bert? Oh boy, what a gymnast she was. She, <laughs> in the, it was the '53 Olympics, I think, that she uh, got the gold. Wasn't that it? <laughs> Oh, I, I thought that was uh, a, a stage name of, uh, of Gypsy Rose's, Rose Lee's sister-in-law. Um, I could be mistaken. No, Cartwright. We know Cartwright, of course, as uh, the lad who brought provisions to Holmes in The Hound of the Baskervilles when he was um, out on the, uh, the moor there, or out in the, uh, on the tour, I should say. He had tinned peaches that uh, Watson found. There and Peaches Cartwright is uh, a, a really nice uh, dessert. Uh, it consists of uh, ten peach halves, um, some Devonshire splits, which um, uh, basically uh, shortcake, shall we mm. say? Um, ten tablespoons of pureed raspberries, uh, some cream to whip. And uh, sugar and vanilla extracts and chocolate chips for the topping. So, uh, you you take the peach halves and and you just dry and rinse them if you're using fresh peaches. Ideally, um, you put them on top of the Devonshire splits, your your halved uh, shortcake, um, and then you uh, spoon the raspberry puree over the peaches. Top it with whipped cream and a little bit of uh, uh, a little bit of chocolate chips. Mm. Simple as anything. Well, that sounds wonderful. Well, my selection for a dessert is a Christmas plum pudding. And a couple of years ago, I did make a, a Christmas plum pudding, and I had a lot of fun with it. Made it in advance, and you know, it was properly doused in brandy, uh, administered several times. You know, during the course of its aging and. Um, and set a flame when I brought it to the table, and it was a lot of fun. And there is a great recipe here for a Christmas plum pudding with all of the things you will need to add to your Christmas plum pudding. Raisins, dried currants, candied citron, candied cherries, almonds, peel of oranges and lemon, cinnamon, ginger, cloves, nutmeg. Oh, boy. It's, um, it's a lot of fun, including, of course, the, uh, the service. But... Um, and, of course, oddly enough, you will not find uh, any plums, as you would think of plums, in the plum pudding. But, um, but there you are. Well, it's, you know why. Because, um, because the plumber, Jack Horner, he stuck <laughs> in his thumb and pulled out a plum. That's why. <laughs> I wonder what Peaches Cartwright thought of that. <laughs> she thought <laughs> it was just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. I suggest you dine with us. And then you're welcome to the sofa. A few hours sleep will do us all good. <laughs>